Good morning, San Gabriel Presbyterian. Is it starting to feel like summer? Is it heating up a little bit out there? I've got my, my new Aloha shirt on in celebration of summer and my sandals. Oh, it's nice to be in Southern California where we can come to church and be relaxed and focus on God instead of trying to make an impression. Speaking of heat, uh, we're, we're going to be talking about Jonah again, and I've been learning about what it might be like to be inside of a whale. Have any of you, everybody raise your hand who's been inside of a whale before. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, we've got one person, good. And Ed, Ed, I saw you adjusting your, your ear strap. I take that as a yes. Um, wh whales, whales come our way. And we think that it's a problem that we get swallowed by a great fish. But, but really, it turns out that the whales in our lives are not meant to harm us, but to help us. So what are the whales in your life? What's, the, uh, what's a whale of a problem that you've got going on right now that it feels like it's a stumbling block, but actually it's, it's going to be something that helps you to get over that hurdle and head you into a better place with God. What, what is it that God's doing in your life right now? Think about that for just a moment as we get started. Because we find God in everything that comes our way, especially here in worship right now as we begin to focus on Him and what He's doing in our lives. Let's prepare our hearts with a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you, we know you, we yearn to know you more, we long to be closer to you, that as we are and as we're in you, that we can be the kind of people that you use to bring about your kingdom. Father, as we approach you this morning and we come into your presence, as we begin to sing, sing your song in our lives. Today we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. We are going to have a call to worship, and it's in unison, so we're all going to read it together. It's from Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen. Good morning, San Gabriel. And that was a great way to open the service with Psalm 100, one of my favorites. And I want to invite, invite you to um, stand and sing with us live out and we act out the joy of that song. So if you're able, please rise.
to see you in a way that we can only see in the context of each other. Thank you, Josie. Uh, we're going to do announcements, but most of them, or all of them, are written in your bulletin, so I'll let you read most of them. I am going to emphasize that next week we are honoring dads and grads. So if you have a graduate, please try and come next week. And then next week we'll also have an open mic. So if you'd like to share about your father, uh, we'll give each one of you a couple minutes to do that. And then also to save the date, September 18th, because we'll be celebrating the 30th anniversary of San Gabriel Press. And now the scripture reading, it's from Jonah 1, verse 17. And if you remember previously, Jonah had just been thrown off the ship. And so now verse 17. And the Lord designated a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish for three days and three nights. And now Pastor Matt. If you hear the story about a dog who bites a man, it hardly raises an eyebrow. If you hear the story about a man who bites a dog, that might uh, get some attention. I saw something on ESPN in the last day or so about uh, some boxers who were in a clinch and one of them reaches over and gives his opponent a nice bite in the neck and I believe that was the end of the fight right there. He got DQ'd. Um, when a man catches a fish, it isn't really news, but when a fish catches a man, that's something else. And when the man lives to tell the story, and that's our story. Verse 17 draws attention to just such an event, and that's all we're going to look at today, that one verse. Donna hardly got started, and she was finished. Uh, and those of you who are in life group, I'm sure you were creative in finding lots to talk about just in one verse. I heard, I heard that some good things happened this morning, uh, Donna and Les, in your group. Among the thousands of great fishing stories, uh, this is one where the fish didn't have to get any bigger uh, as it was told and retold. Uh, so it's down in black and white. It's been told for thousands of years now about a man who's caught by a fish and lives to tell about it, and it's, it ends up being a big part of his testimony. As you can imagine him showing up in Nineveh and saying, you know, I got caught by this fish, and people stopped to listen and hear the rest of it. It's such an incredible verse, such an incredible story that it's been reduced to some as fiction, kind of a, a, a Sunday school fable, a, a bedtime story, and we're gonna address that today because when adults hear the story, descriptors are used like, uh, like this is not really something that happened. Uh, the, teacher, the teacher or preacher may talk about it, but it isn't necessarily so. And then there's this, uh, there's this old agnostic hymn that goes something like this, it ain't necessarily so, it ain't necessarily so, but the preacher's likely to teach you. It ain't necessarily so. And then there's the chorus. Jonah, he lived in a whale. Jonah, he lived in a whale. He made his home in a fish's abdomen. Jonah, he lived in a whale. That's an agnostic, a doubter's hymn. And it kind of sums up why we don't believe the whole story about Jonah, because we think that part was impossible. But before we get into that, 
Think about the negotiations that are underway between God and Jonah back at the beginning of the chapter. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish. Just like that in two verses, we hear the negotiations beginning. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. And then to verse 12, he says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. In other words, I'd rather die than go to Nineveh. And then our verse 17, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. So negotiations are going are going well. They're, they're, they're tough. These are hardball discussions between God and Jonah, and uh, God is taking out his big stick. It's like, you'd rather die. I'm sorry, it's not going to be that easy to get out of your calling. It reminds me of an ad that you might appreciate. Lost dog, missing one leg, blind in one eye, left ear torn recently injured and answers to the name of Lucky. That was, that was Jonah right now. He is a mess, but boy is he ever lucky, isn't he? So there's a bunch of lessons in this verse, but I'm gonna ask you to think about four of them specifically, and they're all great. It's a great fish, and these are great lessons. It's first of all the great abduction. He's been abducted, and we're just gonna look at it at face value. Uh, next is the great confusion, why there has to be so much suffering to get to this point. Then there's the great anticipation, which is really looking ahead because Jonah's referred to by Jesus himself. It's anticipating the resurrection. And then there's the great commission, the great commission, which is all of this is leading up to the fact that he is supposed to be out there preaching, teaching, bringing about repentance. So first of all, the great abduction. This is the story at face value. It's a huge fish, and by the way, the Hebrew never says that it's a whale. It's just described as a great fish, a big fish, a huge fish that swallows a man, and he lives through the ordeal, getting out when he's vomited, not just vomited back into the, into the ocean, but up on dry land. So this is the verse that really bothers people about the story of Jonah. It's impossible. It's an allegory, a myth, or a bedtime story. And, but others have researched into this possibility that it really might have happened. And there's been a lot of suggestions. One has been that it was a whale shark, the rhinocon typus, which can grow up to 70 feet long and has been known to swallow uh, men who were later found alive. There's actually documented proof of that. Um, also, it's been considered that it could have been a Finnoclan shark, which has been known to swallow sea cows, those great big things, up to a thousand pounds whole without a broken bone. Others have suggested that it really could have been a whale. So why would a whale be around a boat like this in a storm? Because the habit of whales has been to follow boats like this because when they throw the garbage overboard, it's something for them to eat. And so if you look at verse five, you can see that they threw all the cargo that was in the ship overboard. And so you can imagine that the shark, the, uh, the whale comes upon some of this and then just follows the trail and catches up to the boat itself, waiting for another snack, which it got in the form of live bait. Two types of whales have been considered, the odontocetes, or mitostesis, or baleen whales. And I'm not a zoologist, but I've, I've found this in the literature, uh, that you can easily research that odontocetes are a blue whale, can be up to 100 feet long and 150 tons, but it can't swallow a man because its teeth act kind of like a strainer and so they only feed on small creatures like crustaceans. But the second type, the mystoceses, are a prime example, would, uh, would be like the sperm whale. And they've been known to swallow huge objects whole. 
including 15-foot sharks, which would be a lot bigger than a human being. So sperm whale have teeth, but they're not for chewing. They're more for just making sure that the prey doesn't get away. And they eat anything that moves, and they swallow it whole, including fish and seals and sea turtles and even prophets, perhaps. Well, researching this stuff is really a pain. When I was growing up, uh, I remember I was about uh, 13 years old in Hawaii, and a salesman came to the door, and he offered uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica. Do you have any, any of you remember that? When, you know, and so my, my parents were really dedicated to our education. They could have been Asian, they weren't, in case you didn't know. And um, they bought a set of Encyclopedia Britannica, and I think that they paid it off you know, at, at $25 a month probably for the next five or 10 years, because it was like a couple thousand dollars at that time. And this would have been about 1972. When you get the Encyclopedia Britannica, you also get the option of ordering research. And so if they don't have it in there, you can put in a request. And you put in a request, and then they have their own researchers, and they send you the information. Can you believe that? I mean, if you didn't have, uh, if you didn't have the internet, this was a great thing. This was really, really cool. And so a, a, a man wanted, uh, Dr. James Montgomery Boyce, wanted to do research on whether it was possible for a whale to swallow a man and the man to live about it, live through it. And so he got this four-page report that included this paragraph. Physiological tests entirely disproved the alleged impossibility of the story. That's a double negative, which means it was possible. It was shown by study of the structure of the sperm whale and its habits that it's perfectly possible for a man to be swallowed alive and after an interval, interval vomited up again also for him to remain alive for two or three days within the whale. One source said, the body's ability to live on a small amount of oxygen, though usually unconsciously, in cold water, is medically well established. Also a factor is the whale's frequent surfacing for air. Sir Francis Fox, living many years ago, said, the manager of a whaling station informs us that the sperm whale swallows lumps of food eight feet in diameter. And in one of these whales, they actually found the skeleton of a shark 16 feet in length, swallowed whole. As part of the Britannica research, A.J. Wilson was quoted. He wrote in the Theological Review at Princeton, issue number 25, a story about a man named James Bartley a seaman on a whaling ship named the Star of the East. And they're part of a group of ships that was sailing off the Falkland Islands when a whale hit one of the ships with its tail and a couple of guys were knocked overboard. They found the body of one of them. Uh, the other one they didn't find, so they presume, he was presumed lost. Well, not long afterwards, they harpooned a whale they brought it up on board, and it would take several days to cut it into little pieces. You know, they'd, they'd take the flesh and they'd take the, the oil out of it for the old oil lamps. lamps. Well, after a, about the second day, they had the, the stomach separated and they had it hoisted up and they noticed that it was sort of jerking around spasmodically. So they, the captain told everybody to get back because they'd had the experience of opening these things up in the past and uh, a shark would come out with its teeth snapping. Well, they opened it up, and there was James Bartley. And he'd been in there for a couple of days, and his skin was all shriveled and white, and he was unconscious. His skin was that way from the gastric juices inside of the whale. But he was still alive, but he was unconscious. They took him to the captain's quarters, and they nursed him, and after about 10 days to two weeks, he slowly regained his consciousness, and he talked about remembering this huge whirring sound as he kind of went through the door that went into the stomach, and that it was terribly hot in there. Um, the zoologists say that it gets up to about 104 degrees, and it was very humid, and that was the last thing he remembered. But he lived. But you can imagine, 
You can imagine that if Jonah had been inside of that stomach for three days and he came out, what he must have looked like. That he goes to Nineveh and, and he's walking around the streets. You know, his hair was probably all bleached and his skin was all white. And he said, I just came from the inside of a whale. And they said, we believe it. You look, you look terrible. And uh, so, so it's, it's established that this great abduction was really possible. It has happened. It's been documented more than once. But apart from that, apart from the natural possibility, is it possible that God would supernaturally provide a way for this to happen? That God had put that storm out in front of Jonah and the ship, and he'd had the whale following behind, and that this was all somehow part of God's plan. It doesn't matter how fast we run, how far away we try to get, we cannot get away from God. Yesterday, I was at a, a great church in Riverside called The Grove, and we're kind of far away, so you may not have heard of it, but I had my little granddaughter, Wonder, about two years old with me, and we were around after the service was over, and she was, we were playing, we were playing catch, you know, chase, inside the, the foyer. Their foyer is like the size of our sanctuary, bigger. And I was chasing her, and she'd be running, and she was just laughing so hard, her little legs about this long, you know, and it's good she's still that, that young and that little, because I was breathing hard. And, and I would sort of circle around her, and then I'd get in front of her, and she'd be looking over her shoulder, and there all of a sudden I'd be there, Rah! and she'd scream and run into my arms. And I thought to myself, I thought, you know, we, we try to run away from God, but we, you know, he ends up being right in front of us, unsurprised and waiting and ready to catch us and pick us up and say, I want to get you going in the right direction. We're just those little children foolishly running away from the supposed disasters of our lives when God says, this is just a redirect. I want to get you going where you need to be and where you're going to be healthy and happy. So, you know, there's, there's natural laws that are sometimes suspended or overwritten by other natural laws. And we think it's supernatural. But, you know, and have you ever seen a 747 take off from fairly close by? When I lived in Hawaii, I used to wait for the bus that was going to take me over the Pali Mountains to the windward side of the island, and I'd stand out there in front of the YMCA in Honolulu, and it wasn't far from uh, the airport, and this was early in the time when we had 747s, in the early 70s, and there'd be a 747 taking off, and if you've ever been close to a 747, the optical illusion, because it's so big, it looks like it's hardly moving, you know. And so it would just be taking off, and it looked like, how is that thing staying up in the air? It was actually moving pretty fast. But the laws of gravity were overwhelmed by the laws of aerodynamics, that the air pressure under the wing was stronger than the air pressure over the wing, and so it was lifting up. It looks like the laws of gravity were being suspended, but that wasn't the case. God works within the laws of the natural to do things that look like they're supernatural to us, but to God it's nothing because God is the one who wrote the rules of the universe and the natural laws. So as I've told you before, I don't even like to talk about natural and supernatural because God doesn't know those categories. It's all natural to him. In Jeremiah 32, 17, it says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Do you remember that, remember that praise song, Josie? Ah, Lord God, thou hast made the heavens. So he's, he's made these rules. And so for him to arrange for a great whale to catch Jonah and to have Jonah in there for three days so Jonah could really think about what was going on, his life was suspended for a moment. And sometimes as the challenges of life come our way, it seems like we're suffering 
but it's a really great chance to stop and to consider, God, is there something that I'm missing? Am I needing to make some kind of a change in how I'm living? And so Jonah had that opportunity. God gave him this great opportunity to reconsider his turning and going the wrong way. The great abduction. Secondly, the great confusion. I don't know whether this came up in your life groups this week, but why would God bring Jonah through such great suffering that Jonah would have to get back on track? Couldn't it have been accomplished some easier way? Isn't this kind of extreme? You know, why, why, is, why is Jonah having to go through this? Or is God rescuing Jonah? Think about it. Jonah's, Jonah's tossed overboard, and the whale is there just waiting to protect him from drowning. And the whale provides for him room and board for free for three days. Verse 17 again, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish for three days and three nights. Other versions, uh, we're always reading from the New American Standard, which is generally considered one of the most accurate word-by-word -word translations. But the, the translations that I read for many years, like in the NIV, it says, the Lord appointed, or the Lord prepared, not appointed, prepared a great fish. So it's, it's a rescue operation that was there in advance. Tevya in Fiddler on the Roof, any of you remember Tevya? He had a great talking relationship with God all the time. He says, God, the way I'm suffering, if this is how you treat friends, no wonder you don't have very many. Maybe Jonah thought that. Why should I have to go, all through, go through all this? Why should any suffering have to take place at all in a world made by God? To make the question practical, why should God's own children have to suffer? Well, first of all, because for Jonah, it's a corrective. Why do we spank our children? Because we'd rather have them receive punishment from us than from the world, right? or from people, because it seems like they're learning a lesson the hard way, but no, the hard way is real life, because real life can be harsh, and people can be harsh. In 1 Chronicles 21, some of you may remember that David has decided to take a census of the people. God has said, don't do that. But David wants to be able to raise money for the treasury. He wants to be able to have track of who all the people are so that he can raise an army. But his prophet comes to him and says to him, God's going to punish you for what you've done because you weren't supposed to do this. But you get to choose. You can either have three years of famine, three years of being swept away by enemies, or three days of terrible pestilence, disease. And David says in response, I'd rather be punished by God than by man because I know that God is merciful even when he punishes. And the prophet says to him, that's a good answer. We'd rather be punished by our friends and by our family who come and speak truth to us. We'd rather have God set us straight than be left to our own devices and to be left to the natural moral laws of the universe. And so we spank our children and we punish them, not because we want them to suffer, but because we'd rather that they suffer that a little bit than suffer life later on. Hebrews 12, 6, for, the Lord, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. For the ones that the Lord loves, he disciplines. C.S. Lewis said, in his problem of pain. Pain plants a flag in the fortress of a rebel soul. Pain plants a flag in the fortress of a rebel soul. So not only is suffering corrective, but secondly, it's also constructive. It's like divine sandpaper. It, it's like chisel for a sculpture. Do you have any rough edges in your life? 
Is there anything that needs to get, get chipped away? Is it possible that God's doing some work on you? I'll ask your spouse about it. I like to do landscaping with river stones, and we had some of them here at the foot of the cross um, at Good Friday. And as you know, river stones are really smooth and they're beautiful, but they've gotten that way from a long time of you know, thousands of years of the, the, the water rushing over them and smoothing them down and making them beautiful. Paul understood this principle. He had what he, was, what he called a thorn in the flesh. And we don't know what it is. There's been a lot of speculation by the historians and commentators. But Paul understood that if he was suffering in some way, that at the very least, God was allowing it and God may have even been providing it for his humbling to remind him that, that you know, Paul was, was a genius and he was powerful, and he said, you know, maybe I just need to be humble. And he says, I asked God to take it away three times, but God just said, my grace is enough. What is it that you're going through that feels horrible, but God is, is, is smoothing you down and making you more beautiful? One of my friends said to me, I wonder if we've lost our loved ones, Matt, because they were ready. They were ready for heaven. But, but you, you needed some more time that God's still working on you. Boy, it's a lot easier, isn't it? If we just let God have his way and we just give in and we let this stuff take place in our lives and in our hearts, that we just do the right thing. In James 1, the very beginning of the book, it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Samuel Rutherford in 1600s Scotland wrote a little quip. He said, why should I tremble at the plowing of the Lord, making deep furrows in my soul? I know he's no idle husbandman. He intends a crop, a great harvest. So God may be plowing up our lives, but it because, it's because he's planting seeds. He intends that we be really fruitful. If we were to interview the Ninevites, they'd be really happy that jo Jonah ended up as whale puke because it meant their salvation. That was the crop. That was the harvest for them. So out of great tension and pressure can come really good stuff. Theodore Steinway, who put 243 strings on a steel frame that exerted 40,000 pounds of pressure on the frame was creating the Steinway piano. So the tension and the stress in our lives can produce some really beautiful music if our lives are in the hands of the great composer and the great musician, God. So punishment can be corrective. It can also be constructive. But it's for the purpose, all of this in the case of Jonah was about number three, the great anticipation. The great anticipation. This is the only historical event that Jesus used as an example of his own resurrection. In Matthew 12 it says, then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you which is really odd considering that Jesus had been bringing the dead back to life and casting out demons and healing the sick and the blind and calming the seas. They wanted a sign. They're basically asking for a sign right then and there. Miracles on demand. A parallel verse in Matthew 16 says, show us a sign from heaven. They're looking for messianic proof. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given it 
but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This is called uh, typically a, a pictured prophecy. He's looking back at this image of Jonah in the fish, and he's saying, although nobody realized that at the time, this is going to be me. This is going to be me buried in the tomb for three days and three nights before I'm resurrected. Um, we also call this a type for Jesus on the cross. Another great type would have been uh, Abraham and Isaac, where Abraham is about to sacrifice his son the way that God does sacrifice his son. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to do something like Jonah, and that's the very best example that I can show you. It's already happened. He's saying that's, that's how he responds to their demand. He says, he says, when that happens, there's not going to be any doubt but that I'm the Messiah. What's interesting is that even when Jesus does all this kind of stuff, the supernatural stuff, still some people will say, I don't believe it. They were there and they were seeing all this. That's why I say if you're really going to impact a skeptic's life, you can get into these theological discussions with them, but I, I don't actually see it as that necessarily effective. I met somebody at the Rose Bowl the other day, and um, uh, he was a Japanese-American, and his name was Stan, and he's, he found out I was a pastor, and he said, he said, you know, I have a lot of questions. Can we meet sometime? And I said, uh, I said, yeah, anytime. That'd be great. And then after a little while, he kind of sidled up next to me, and he says, he says, you know, one thing that really bothers me is that, uh, is that so many times Christians uh, try to force you to believe. And I said, well, that's not how Jesus worked. Jesus basically got in a relationship with people, and he blessed them, and he helped them, and he told them stories, and he left it up to them. The only people that he was really hard on were the ones that were religious and thought that they were so good already. He said, there's no way that somebody who's like that is really going to get it, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? He didn't try to convince them. He didn't try to, he may have argued a little bit, but in most cases, he would just give examples. This is the way that life is in the kingdom. And, and so many times people said they just immediately resonated with it. They said, oh, yeah, yeah. And then they would, they would understand and they'd follow. When Stan, when, when Stan heard that, he said, boy, I, he said, I really want to get together with you. I said, well, you can ask your questions, but the very best thing is just start reading the Bible. I said, you're going to find out that it makes sense. He said, let's go. And then afterwards, a friend said to me, Boy, I've been, I've been trying to convince him for a long time. I'm so happy that he, that he listened to you and he was willing. So a lot of times, skeptics aren't really looking for answers. They're just trying to prove their point with us and win an argument. Verse 12, he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me this great storm has come upon you. This wasn't the best answer to them. You know, they didn't want to remember the seaman. They didn't want to throw him in. They were really in many ways closer to God than Jonah was, which we find out with non-Christians. A lot of times God has been working on them. And he could have said to them, hey, take me back to Nineveh. Turn the ship around, we're going back to Joppa. And immediately the, the seas would have quieted. But he didn't want to do it. He was avoiding it. He was avoiding his commission. He was avoiding what God had told him. So, you know, that storm could have been a storm of punishment. It, but really it was a storm of correction, wasn't it? How does Jonah interpret it? Jonah is seeing the storm as being punishment. So he's like, let's finish this off. Just let me die, and you'll be okay. 
A lot of times we get so stubborn as God is correcting us, we'd say, I'd rather eat worms and die than do what God wants me to do. And we don't give God a chance to really get us back on the right track. We're so stubborn in our hearts that we don't, we just don't do what he wants us to do. He's got this, he's got this job to do. Look ahead to chapter three, the beginning of the chapter, the first three verses, or two and a half verses. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh the great city and proclaim to it the proclamation I'm going to tell, tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Negotiations completed. Negotiations successful. God gets his way. It could have been so much easier, right, if Jonah had just, when he first got the word in verse one, if he just packed up and headed east instead of west. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Fortunately, God doesn't court-martial him, didn't execute Jonah for desertion. So, you know, it seems like when we fail, God isn't so surprised. But God is an expert at chasing and catching and bringing home. So I'm chasing my little granddaughter yesterday and picking her up and even though I caught her, it's a joyous moment. When we get caught up in our being away without leave, when we're deserted, it's a joyous thing. It's not a bad thing. But a lot of times we don't even pay attention to what's happening. Why are these bad things happening? Just to remind you, you have a calling. You have a great commission. And I've been talking to a lot of retired people lately and I've said, what's your calling? It's tempting to think that when we retire, that we can retire from God's army. When I was in seminary, my mother's uncle, Matthew, her favorite uncle, for whom I was named, uh, came to me one time in the driveway of my grandmother's house and he came up to me and he said, some of the leaders of the church came to me and they want me to help with our new building campaign. And I told them, I've been, serving, I've been serving the church and taking leadership for a long time, but I'm retired now. It's time for some of the younger people to take over. And he said, what do you think of that? And he was in his mid to late 70s, and I was about 50 years younger. And so I said, well, I'm sure that's, uh, that makes sense to me too. But I started asking people this because a lot of us have had callings as, as, as uh, nurses or pharmacists or teachers or working for the government, whatever it is that we've been called to do, and we retire and we think, now I can really sit back and relax, and I can play. But there's no such thing as retiring when it comes to serving God. But we may get a redirection. Now we've got more time to really serve God, and so it's a great time to reevaluate our calling. So we've all got a specific calling in our lives. But we've all got the same calling to serve God and to receive the Great Commission. Go out there and impact the world for Christ. The Great Commission is for everybody and there's nowhere to run for it. We're meant to be out there to receive here at church but then to take the blessing and to share it with other people. A mark of Christian maturity is that we take the Great Commission seriously. It's one thing to show up for worship and to even spend time with God every day, but people who are really close to Jesus can't help but have compassion for the lost and the lonely. It's instinctive. We can't escape it. And if we're not feeling it, we've got to ask whether or not we're really close to Jesus. So it's kind of like a young man who's been pampered all his life, and he's been out there and he's been playing around, and he's wanted his toys, and he just wants to, at some point, he realizes that he needs to buckle down. And he goes to his father and he says, 
I want to be a part of the family business. I want to contribute. I want to help you. I've been messing around all these years, but I want to get serious and do my share. When a local church says, God, I understand what you're about. You have a global vision to bless people everywhere and to bring, bring them into the kingdom. I want to be a part of that. I'm with you. I'm in it to win it. That's a mark of maturity. Not just coming to church because it's a local love fest, a holy huddle, a little lift that we get from hearing about how nice God is and the kingdom. It's a decision to get out of the stands and onto the field. And it's way more fun to be in the game than to just be watching it. That's maturity. There's an article on the ESPN website right now about players who were injured and they were hurt, but they decided to get back in the game anyway. And they, they have two examples from uh, Michael Jordan in the playoffs. Uh, they've got a couple examples uh, of uh, people who were uh, playing against the Lakers, uh, one from the Knicks back in the 1960s. Um, who was it? Uh, What's that? Willis Reed. Willis Reed, that's right. Uh, there's, there's Carrie Shrug, who, uh, Becky, you remember Carrie Shrug from 1996? She had a broken foot from her vault, but the team really needed her to run down one more time and do her vault and stick it, and she does, and this was in 1996 uh, in Atlanta, and she managed it, and there's a picture of her on the website just, oh, she's in agony, but they don't look at the face, they look at the body. And there she is in great pain, and she holds it for whatever is required, one or two seconds, and then she falls down. You're like, how did she run? How did she get over that vault and, and, and hold herself up with nothing on one leg? It doesn't matter what's going on in our lives. We want to be in the game. And in my experience, when I'm really hurting and confused in my own life, and I'm wondering, what am I supposed to be doing? I say, I know that I'm supposed to be a blessing. And somehow when I start putting other people ahead of myself and caring for them, my hurts start to be healed. My heart starts to come back together when I put other people first. Getting off the bench and into the game is so much more fun. Do you know that the church is the only society that doesn't exist for itself, but for the people that are outside of it. We are here for San Gabriel. We are here for your neighbors and your coworkers and your family members who aren't here, your colleagues at work, your classmates, the teller at the bank, the bag boy at the supermarket. J.T. Riles was a bishop of Liverpool and he wrote these words. The highest form of selfishness is when a man is contented to go to heaven alone. So a little dog was hit and was lying by the roadside and it was struggling and a doctor was going by and he saw and he stopped and he pulled over alongside the dog and he looked at it and he picked it up and he took it home and he, he bandaged it up and the dog was mostly just stunned and so it, it got its wits together and he was carrying it out to the garage and the dog jumped out of his arms and ran away. And the, the doctor said, how ungrateful. The next day he's, he's in the kitchen and he hears a scratching on the door and he goes to the door and there's the dog back again with another injured dog. Yeah. That's why we're here, to bring the other messed up people. Do you know how many hurting people there are out there? And they're lonely, and they may put up a false front that they're okay and that they've got it together, but they're little lost doggies waiting to be brought to the one who can really help. And you may feel like what's going on in your life right now is all you can handle. But maybe you've been running west when you should have been going east. And God has brought a whale of a situation into your life because he's trying to get you back on track. 
and that you can be a blessing to others. It's selfishness to be playing around. If you come here as a sponge and you're soaking it all up, but you're not going out there to wring it out into somebody else's life, it's not right. God wants to bless you, but the blessing actually grows when you share it with others. So all of this, this is just standard operating procedure, SOP, for how God works in our lives, that he wants to get us back on track. And sometimes it, you know, he may whisper it first, and he may get around to, to spanking you, and he may have to even do more to get us to where we need to be with him. But it's a pivotal moment when Jonah thinks that it's about punishment, and he realizes that it's about correction. And, and, and he, 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 he finds out that all this bad stuff, the storm, the pagan sailors, getting thrown overboard, getting eaten by a fish, all this is, is not so bad because he gets to be part of one of the greatest revivals in the history of mankind. What a privilege, what a privilege it is that God disciplines those he loves. I guarantee you he loves you. I guarantee you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us that much. Can we just drive by and turn our backs and not care? We know that you care. So must we. And you've given this prayer, care, and share assignment that we be reaching out to even just two or three people for the sake of their coming to know Jesus. And we don't have to have words, we don't have to have answers, but that we just are consistent in loving people and blessing them and sharing with them our lives. Lord, we are people of the table. Teach us how to be hospitable with our homes, our time, our lives, that we care enough to be involved with others. I thank you for this great example of Jonah that he was redirected and we might learn to do the same. How we love you, Lord. How we love your ways that are so far above our ways. We don't understand how all this happens and what seems like supernatural is just natural that you are involved in our lives. Help us to learn to see it, that we are experiencing God in our lives right now and that you are actively involved with us, that you're getting us to where we need to be. Blessed to be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.
storms come, may they redirect us to the way in which we are called that we may be part of God's great redeeming work in this world. The kingdom is upon us. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is coming. May it be so first in your life and mine. So go then in the name of Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship and the power and the love and all that is in the Holy Spirit in you as you leave today. Amen.